I'm also a physics student here at KU, so that's why I get the honor of introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Rogan. So an assistant professor here at KU, he earned his BA from Princeton and his PhD from Caltech and came to KU by way of Harvard, um, where he was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. So he's got a pretty impressive resume. Um, he's a particle physicist, and his work is focused largely at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which is in Geneva, Switzerland. His research focuses on discovering new particles and forces and symmetries um, on scales that are only achievable at LHC. And he also happens to be the patient soul that taught me and many of my classmates quantum mechanics. So, you know, he's pretty great for that. So please sit back and enjoy as we begin hunting the God particle, the Higgs boson at the high energy frontier with Dr. Rogan. <laughs> Okay, can you all hear me? Well, thank you, Corinne, for that very generous introduction. That was very nice. So today we're gonna to talk about Higgs hunting at the energy frontier. And I hope that's not too loud. Let's, let's turn it down a notch. So, new particle could be physics, holy grail. A lot of, arrived the most solid evidence of the existence of the Higgs boson. The boson of Higgs discovered with 99.9999% of certainty. This was all on July 4th, 2012. A lot of you may have not noticed that this was a very exciting day, but all of this excitement was based around a particular announcement. And that announcement went as follows. At a seminar held at CERN today, as a curtain raiser to this year's major particle physics conference, the ATLAS and CMS experiments presented their latest preliminary results in the search for the long sought after Higgs particle, and both experiments observe a new particle in the mass region around 125 giga electron volts. So, I'm sure you're all very excited about this statement. The question is, what does this mean? And why should you be excited? And then furthermore, what are the implications of this message for our universe. So that's gonna be the topic of this talk a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a story. And to some degree, this is a true story. It definitely happened, but this is also a story about belief and evidence and interpretation. And being an experimental scientist, one thing I've realized is that you should always hedge and you can never be completely certain of anything. So I'll go ahead and say, this is an extremely unlikely to be false story. And you're going to see during this talk how unlikely we think it is that this is false, and you can judge for yourself what you believe. So to begin, this story, like many great stories, is set in a couple different settings. One of them is the real world with humans and people, and another of them is a different world, a different existence that's very much real, but is a little hard to access, but is still very important and inextricably linked with our world here. Now, if you didn't understand the title entirely, Higgs Hunting at the High Energy Frontier, I should just first put out a disclaimer. Myself, nor to my knowledge, any of my colleagues have ever engaged in hunting of humans, Higgs or otherwise. But what we want to do is we want to understand the physics of a very different but important world. And so this is sort of where our story begins. And it, the reason why we go to this world in the first place and try to ask questions is because as particle physicists, being very modest, we just try to, to find the answers to a few simple questions. What is everything made of? What holds it all together? And what are the physical rules that govern all of the universe? And in order to answer these questions, particularly what is everything made of and what holds it all together, we find ourselves looking smaller. And so in general, if you want to figure out what something is made of, look closer. So, okay, look closer. I get my, my good old Hello Kitty microscope out here and I try to take a look closer. But what we find very quickly is that there's a little bit of an issue. And you can understand this issue with even very basic physics. For light, the energy of light and its wavelength is equal to a constant. C, the speed of light. And what that means is, if you want to achieve very small wavelengths, which are necessary to resolve very small features, you need a lot of E, 
Physics behaves differently at different length scales. Every time we've looked smaller and closer, we discover something new, something that resembles our physical world, our macroscopic world, but is always a little different. And looking at smaller scales requires a lot more energy to continually go smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, first off, before we begin talking specifically about Peter Higgs or the Higgs boson or the Higgs mechanism, I want to introduce you to some of the characters in this story. And these are not human characters yet, but these are the particle characters that sort of motivate the whole reason for this search in the first place. So at the frontier of energy and size, at the highest energies we can achieve in a laboratory currently, and the, the smallest sizes we can look at, who lives there? What are the flora and fauna of the energy frontier? What we find is a collection of different subatomic particles, the fundamental building blocks of our universe. There's quarks and leptons. It's what everything we know is made of. And in fact, most matter that we know about is essentially made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Protons and neutrons made from these first generation quarks. They come in three different generations, each heavier by sometimes orders of magnitude than the last one. And we have absolutely no idea why, but that's just what we've seen so far. There's gauge bosons. These are the force carriers. These are subatomic particles or fields that allow these different quarks and leptons to communicate with each other, to talk to each other, to communicate and interact. Photons carry the electromagnetic force, which I think many of you are familiar with. This is magnetism, electricity, essentially all of the things that make this possible. Gluons carry the strong force. This is what holds together these quarks in nuclei, which is also a pretty important phenomena for the existence of the world as we know it. Z and W bosons carry the weak nuclear force. And this is very important because the weak nuclear force is what's essentially responsible for the fusion reactions that drive the sun and allow us to have energy and sunlight and power and life on Earth. And the standard model of particle physics is the theory mathematically that describes how all these different subatomic particles interact. And it's extremely simple. It's so simple that I can write in an abridged version this theory on the front of a coffee mug with leaving quite a bit of space above and below it and on the other side. It's very elegant. It's very symmetric. This theory has a lot of built-in important symmetries, a lot of aesthetically beautiful aspects. And maybe most importantly, scientifically, it's very predictive. This theory nowadays, for some measurements, has been confirmed to one part in 10 to the 13. So this is the most accurate experimental theory we currently have right now. But in 1964, the picture was a little different. In 1964, these were the particles that we didn't even necessarily discover yet, but we were maybe postulating or thinking about just a subset of the ones we know about now. And people were very caught up on this part of the theory or the Lagrangian of the standard model. This was before the standard model. And what we found was that this part of the standard model that people were trying to use to describe weak interactions, the decays of, say, neutrons through a force or an interaction postulated to maybe involve a massive particle, People were describing things called gauge theories and trying to use it to understand what was happening experimentally. But there's a problem because this part of this equation, which is extremely elegant, and there's a little bit of a liberty here, this is not exactly what people were looking at, but something very closely related, is a theory of massless particles, particles without mass. But what we know, and what people knew in 1964, is that particles have mass. The particles we've observed already have mass. And this particle, the W boson, that mi mitigate, or excuse me, mediates this weak force, which only works at very small ranges, people were on trying to understand why, and it's because it was likely massive. But the theory could not accommodate that with the symmetries, the aesthetics, the predictability, and computational ca capabilities that people wanted to have. So in 1964, P.W. Higgs, uh, Professor Peter Higgs, proposed what has become known as now the Higgs mechanism. And effectively, the Higgs mechanism was meant to try to explain how, in this theory of massless particles, these particles could have mass, 
in a way that allows these symmetries to be maintained, which is a very difficult concept and a little tricky, but the idea was as follows. He postulated a new scalar field called the Higgs field, and he postulated that this field experiences a potential. Now, for those of you who aren't physicists, a potential you can think about as sort of like a well, and the Higgs is a field or a little ball that sits at the bottom of this well. It maybe quantum fluctuates around the bottom of this well, but it's sitting at the lowest potential energy where it likes to be. But perhaps something happened in the universe that started to change the shape of this well. And if this well started developing these two minima like this, perhaps this Higgs field would like to shift on over to a little lower ground, something with a little less potential energy. And then perhaps now this potential looks like this. And rather than sitting at the origin, at the most symmetric place where the average value on whatever this axis is would be zero, the symmetry is broken spontaneously by this changing in potential. And this Higgs particle sits in a non-symmetric place. It could sit here, it could sit here. In fact, this is often called the Mexican hat potential because it's in the complex plane. So it could sit anywhere around a circle. So this is a spontaneous breaking of symmetry. And what it effectively means is that this Higgs particle always is turned on, or it has what we call a vacuum expectation value that is not zero. Now, what does this have to do with particles and masses? Well, the idea was we have this theory of massless particles, which can't allow, given the symmetries, to accommodate just adding masses by hand to these particles. So what Higgs proposed was doing this in a very, I would say, non-parsimonious way. It almost seemed contrived, like a Rube Goldberg machine to some degree. The idea was to give these particles mass through their interactions with the Higgs field, and then turn the Higgs field on due to its potential, make sure it's always turned on. And so these particles don't just have regular masses, they get masses because they're interacting with something that is persistently everywhere and is always turned on. So what do we mean by that? Let me give you a little analogy to explain the Higgs mechanism and how it talks to, to different particles. Now this is a, an analogy due to David Miller um, at uh, the University of Glasgow. And it usually goes with Albert Einstein walking into a cocktail party. Although since here we're here at KU, let's pretend that there's a nice Jayhawk walking to this cocktail party. And Naturally, if you're at a cocktail party, if you're anything like me and you see someone who is a Jayhawk walking into the party, you're very interested. And you will naturally want to understand <laughs> what this person is, how there is a physical Jayhawk walking into a party, and maybe you will swarm around them. So in this analogy, this Jayhawk is essentially an elementary particle. And this cocktail party, your all attendees, are the Higgs field. And what happens is, as particles move through this field, they get dragged, they have resistance, almost like molasses moving through some material where you get slowed down and encumbered. And these are these particles attaining mass, interacting with this field. But the other important prediction of this particular postular theory was that this field could also manifest itself in other ways. So suppose and said that instead of a Jayhawk walking to the party, suppose this gentleman here yells a rumor about a Jayhawk coming to the party momentarily. This rumor similarly could spread through this cocktail party and through its attendees, clumping together, each talking about this, this <laughs> Jayhawk about to show up. This is what's called a particle or the Higgs particle, basically an excitation of the Higgs field. So not only because this field predicted to give particles their mass through its interactions with them, but it could also potentially produce, even for a fleeting moment of, section, a moment of a second, a particle itself, the Higgs particle, or the Higgs boson. So this is what we think is happening at the subatomic scale, and in 1964, this is what was predicted, but it took quite some time to fill in all the blanks, fill in all of these missing particles, and the reason is, it's very difficult to reach or access or study the energy frontier. And so the question is, how do you reach the energy frontier? And the answer, well, it's as easy, or as you'll see, as hard as E equals mc squared. The idea is that you can get 
additional mass or energy equivalently and convert between the two. And what we want to do is if we want to produce massive particles, particles that have increasingly large masses, we need increasingly high energy. And it's equivalent to saying if we want to look increasingly small, we need increasingly high energy. But what we can do using this very nice relation is trade the energy of motion of lighter particles, like protons, and collide them together to achieve the mass energy of heavier ones, like in this case, the top quark, which is about 175 times heavier than a proton. So because of this equivalence between energy and mass, we can convert kinetic energy into mass energy. And we've been doing this. We, the, uh, the bigger we, for quite some time before my birth. And you can see our progress up until very recently. This is the year of discovery of different fundamental particles, the ones we were introduced to shortly previously, and their respective masses in the units particle physicists prefer, electron volts, which if you prefer joules, it's a very small amount of joules. But as you can see, these particles populate many orders of magnitude in these different masses. And I've drawn, this is not a fit, but this is just a line that I drew here to indicate that it's taken some time and will continue to take more time to achieve higher and higher masses and discover potentially more and more particles. And the reason is, it's very hard to get a lot of energy in a very small space, to achieve the energy density necessary to realize, even for a fleeting moment, these different particles. As you can see, if the Higgs is sitting somewhere further up here, it may take some time to discover it. Now, in order to do this, the most recent iteration of this quest to extend our reach to smaller and smaller scales and bigger and bigger energies is the Large Hadron Collider. So what this is, is a 27 kilometer circumference proton-proton collider located right outside of Geneva, Switzerland in the suburb called Moran. It's two counter-rotating beams of protons, so protons going in each direction with different energies. So these are the different energies we've run at. These are in tera electron volts, which is, well, in terms of electron volts, that's 10 to the nine, excuse me, 10 to the 12 electron volts, seven times 10 to the 12, eight times 10 to the 12, 13 times 10 to the 12 in the beams and the collision energies. And they collide at fixed points around the ring where there's located different experiments. CMS, which is the experiment I currently work on, is one of them, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Atlas is a different one, which I used to work on, which we'll also see some, some things from there. And so the idea is that these high energies allow us to access the energy frontier, the tera electron volt energy frontier, in a laboratory. Now, the LAC at CERN is a very impressive machine. Several thousand billion protons in one of bunch, and these bunches are order tens of microns in lateral dimensions and maybe order centimeters long, are going around this 27 kilometer ring at close to the speed of light, 99.999999 times the speed of light, and they're colliding 40 million times a second. So every 25 nanoseconds, these collisions are happening when we're running this experiment. And they're violent collisions, achieving very high energies. And you can take a little bit of a liberty and estimate this to be, while well, this temperature, I think it's about 160 quadrillion degrees Celsius. And it's many times hotter than even the temperature of the innermost parts of our sun. So that's pretty, pretty hot. But the question is, it's one thing to be able to collide things at very high energies and produce very spectacular explosions or collisions. But the question is, how do you see anything in these collisions? How do we interpret these collisions? How do we understand what the heck is in this giant explosion of color and particles? How can we see particles at the frontier in energy and size? What does it mean to discover a particle at the frontier of energy and size? Well, as you've probably realized, we don't use this microscope, although I think it's very nice and I like showing it. But what we do do is we try to look for pictures of particles interacting with matter. So this is a very old picture. I think this picture dates to about 1917 and represents some of the early ways that scientists used to look at how particles interact with matter. So what they would do is they would take photoemulsion plates, basically like 
Kodak plates that the company would make that people use for photographs, and they would stack them on top of each other, and they would put a permanent magnet on top and put them on a balloon and send them into the atmosphere. And the idea was that when particles interacted or passed through, cosmic ray particles bombarding the Earth with these photoemulsion plates, they would leave traces of these interactions. And when you developed these photos, you would see things like this. So a particle interacting with this plate and then things flying out. And because there was a magnet there, any charged particles would bend and you could actually measure the properties of those particles based on how much they bended. And you could see what sort of different interactions were allowed by what sort of things flew out of particles. And for decades, this is how we discovered many of the earliest particles in the picture of the standard model through natural sources bombarding the Earth with cosmic rays. Later, so this was in the early 70s, there was the Gargamel experiment. This was basically a giant tank of superfluid helium located at CERN. And what you would see is, similarly to this, but in real time, when particles passed through the superfluid helium and interacted, they would leave little trails of bubbles if they're charged particles. And you would get these wonderful pictures of little bubbles and trajectories which would tell you that a particle came in and you could actually see the interactions that these subatomic particles had and see their trajectories, again in a magnetic field, so that charged particles bended, seeing these different interactions. And so even though they're very tiny things, we can project these interactions up on visible scales and actually watch as particles interact with matter. Now this experiment discovered the first evidence of the neutral current, or basically interactions involving the Z boson. The W and Z bosons themselves were discovered at the UA1 and UA2 experiments in 83 at CERN. And you can see that these pictures of interactions of particles with matter are becoming increasingly, let's say, nuanced and complicated and powerful in terms of understanding what is happening with particles interacting with matter. The other important distinction here is that this is also an earlier version of an accelerator, relative, similar to the LHC, where particles are accelerated in a ring and smashed together inside of one of these detectors. So the big difference in the quantum leap in later in the last century was looking at particle interactions, but through natural sources of particles bombarding the Earth following to then producing these interactions ourselves experimentally and studying the results by looking essentially at pictures, pictures of particles interacting with matter. So today, and in the early part of this century, we set out to build particle detectors that would be able to operate at the Large Hadron Collider and hopefully observe a Higgs particle. This is the example of one of these detectors being assembled. This is the CMS or compact muon solenoid detector. I was working on it this time. The idea is that in this tiny volume of these collisions, for a fraction of a second, when you're achieving these incredibly high temperatures, you surround these interactions with this very, very complicated instrument, which is effectively like a 75 million pixel camera, taking pictures in both time and space of these particles interacting. And so the idea is we accelerate these particles, and in fact at CERN, there's several rings of accelerators. Each of these were older rings, older accelerators that at one point were the world's most powerful, feeding into each other. This is actually the ring that was used to discover the W and Z bosons in the 80s. And finally they feed into the LHC, where you have different interaction points. If we zoom into the tunnel of the LHC, there you can see these superconducting magnets which bend these incredibly high energy beams around inside the magnets, of course, passing between Switzerland and France very, very frequently. Here's an artist's rendition of a proton with the three valence quarks bouncing around in a sea of quarks and gluons, flying around this ring with a hundred billion of its favorite friends, and then meeting another proton at the center of one of these detectors and producing a very satisfying, colorful collision. So this is the idea, and this was the idea in the early part, or earlier part of this century, and this was how we planned to get to the energy frontier and observe what's happening at the energy frontier. Now, a detector like CMS is essentially built up of layers of different technologies, kind of like an onion. 
So this is a transverse view or a transverse slice of CMS. You can imagine protons going into the page or out of the page through the beam axis here. And the idea is that different layers of these detectors measure different properties of different particles flying out of these interactions. So a tracker is sort of like, it, it basically measures hits and it's kind of like connect the dots, can fit mapping out the trajectories just like the early bubble chambers of these different particles. There's calorimeters that measure their energies, a big old magnet, in fact, the world's most powerful in terms of energy stored magnet, a four Tesla magnet over a very big volume, about the size of maybe this auditorium. And then muon chambers made up of gaseous detectors that can check, detect muons. The idea being that when these particles smash together inside these detectors, and this is an actual recorded event from CMS animated here, they leave electronic signals in each piece of this detector, each of these different layers. And what we effectively need to do is go through each of these different layers of the detector and connect the dots, take all of these different particles in the event, try to identify them, try to figure out their energy, momentum, charge, and other properties, and then try to interpret what is happening in each of these events. And we do this 40 million times a second when we're operating this detector, recording, an enormous amount of data. Now, this was going to be the final piece in the puzzle, at least for us, for this iteration of the energy frontier, looking at now very high resolution event displays with the CMS detector, being able to resolve even the, the most fine and minute details of these collisions and hopefully observing the Higgs boson, finally. And in 2006, I was young and dumb and I was one of the, the students along with thousands of other colleagues, both students and PhDs from over 120 different countries, trying to put this thing together and make it work. And we were all very excited and very confident. And our, through our labors in 2008, we were ready to turn on for the first time. And so in the fall of that year, we turned on and we ran for about a week and a half or two weeks. And when they cranked up the energy, and the expectation was building of what would come out of these experiments and these collisions, it blew up. So in 2008, in the very early weeks of running for the first time at the LHC, we had a helium leak. And this helium was used to cool these superconducting magnets. And when these superconducting magnets heat up, they lose superconductivity and a lot of energy. So in this case, it was about six megajoules of energy was dumped instantaneously out of this system. Now, the system is supposed to be able to handle this. That's the equivalent of the energy of about, let's say, a 30-ton SUV smashing into something at 90 miles per hour. So it's a lot of energy. And there was a system for allowing this to dissipate, but one bad solder in a copper wire meant that the resistance was too high and the whole thing blew up. And it sent a shock wave around this entire ring and it literally pulled steel and bent it and ripped apart parts of the magnets, which was a big bummer because we had spent quite a lot of time and people a lot more time than I had getting ready for this thing and it meant an enormous delay. And in fact, this was just one of several issues that had happened in the build up to the attempt to discover the Higgs boson. In the early 90s, there was the SSC proposed, the uh, superconducting super collider, which would have been about three times the energy of the LHC, located in Texas. The funding was canceled and it didn't occur. We tried to put together the LHC. There were delays, it blew up. We actually, well, in 2008, people were thinking that maybe there was a reason we would never see the Higgs. Now, I include this paper here, the abstract and title of it, not because it's a remarkable paper. Well, it's remarkable in the sense that it's, it was quite outrageous, but it represented some of the thoughts at the time in 2008. What these authors argued in this paper was that the Higgs or nature didn't want us to produce Higgses and that from the future, this possibility of producing many Higgs bosons was causing causal back pressure, which was causing disasters in the past to prevent us from discovering the Higgs boson. Now, not many people believe this necessarily, but it seemed like we were doomed to never observe this particle. No one knew what the mass should be necessarily. They've been searching for it for decades, essentially since the birth of the standard model in the early 70s. No one understood at this point whether or not we would ever have a device capable of actually discovering it. 
And in fact, there were other issues. So in 2009, uh, the Department of Energy in the US was sued in a court in Hawaii by a gentleman who claimed that if we were able to successfully turn on this device and crank up the energy, that it would destroy the world. Um, this is actually an interview with him in 2009 with Daily Show correspondent John Oliver here, where he made the very eloquent argument that, of course, there's two possibilities. Either the world will be destroyed if we turned on the LAC or will not be destroyed. Therefore, there was likely a 50-50 chance of that happening. And uh, this is the view he espoused in this interview, which gave us a lot of chuckles. But at the same time, we, we were worried, is it even possible for this to be stopped at all because of such a lawsuit? The answer was no, fortunately. And finally, in 2010, it was time again. The magnets were fixed. The accelerator was ready, the detectors were, were tuned up and ready to go, and we tried again. And it worked. So this time, the LHC was able to operate, not at the full design energy, but still at a quite remarkable energy. And so the first thing we did with the LHC is, recalling all of these discoveries over the last century of all these different particles or groups of particles, in some cases these are mesons built up of quarks, we were able to reproduce all of these results from a, about a century in, in a few years. So once we actually turned on in 2010, we were able to, to start discovering each of these particles or rediscovering the standard model of particle physics. But one thing you also notice here is that these pictures that are representative of these original discoveries, a lot of them are, are pictures of interactions, of interactions with particles and matter, whereas these ones on the bottom are generally not. These are distributions of many events showing these very curious and dramatic looking bumps. What you find at the LHC is that these very high energies, a lot of things are happening. And in fact, because we have so many collisions and there's so many possibilities and these detectors have so many, let's say, complications, that is not enough to observe a single instance of any interaction because it could be just a mundane less interesting or less rare interaction occurring, mimicking something that you're looking for. And so in order to establish the presence of any of these particles, we need to see many examples of these interactions. And over many events, we can build up these features that indicate the presence of these new particles. Now, for the Higgs, this is a swimming pool. For the Higgs, what we expected was that if we were to imagine an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and fill up this swimming pool with little pieces of sand, the Higgs boson events, events in our data set that actually contained Higgs bosons, would be about two grains of sand. So we needed to search through all of these events to find evidence of these two grains of sand, of these Higgs boson events, of these examples of a Higgs being produced and decaying to other particles which interact with our detector. Now, this is a very daunting task, but the first step to do it is to try to guess what we think the Higgs may do if we were able to produce one. So one thing you may have noticed earlier in this talk is that I, I was telling you about a lot of these different exotic subatomic particles, but when I was talking about particles interacting with the detector, only a subset of particles will do that. What essentially happens is some of these particles, like a Higgs, when we produce them, they only exist for a fleeting moment. In the case of the Higgs, about 10 to the negative 22 seconds before decaying to other particles. But what we can do is we can look for examples of events that contain particles that we think the Higgs could decay to, and we can look at the correlations between the energy and momentum of those particles to see whether or not we think there was a Higgs boson in the event. So one way we thought the Higgs could decay was to four muons. So a Higgs decaying to four muons, which we would see in our detector. Here's an actual event from the early days of running of CMS where we saw four muons, and this could be a Higgs event. And what we do is we take these four muons and their energy and momentum that we measure, and we calculate something called an invariant mass, which is basically just a function of the things we measure in these particles. And if they came from a Higgs boson, this invariant mass of these four muons will have a corresponding mass that tells us the mass of the Higgs in this event. And so what we do is essentially we take all the events that have, say, four muons, or in this case, just four leptons, and we look at the invariant mass, and then we wait. So in early 2011, when we started the first longer run of the LHC, after the initial ones in 2010, 
we started collecting these events. And so what you see here is as a function of the date and the amount of data, so this is the integrated luminosity, which is the, the units we use for data, we started collecting these events, and this is them being histogrammed in real time here. This red shape is our expected background, so events that are not Higgs, and there's a lot of them. But what you find is that as we saw more and more data and accounted for each of the different backgrounds we expected, we began to see a feature, a feature that was not explained by our predictions. And in fact, this feature, we came to believe, was evidence of the Higgs boson, a bump in a place where there shouldn't have been a bump in the absence of a new particle. Now, this was not the only way we hoped to observe the Higgs. In fact, there were other channels. So the other important channel was Higgs decaying to two photons. Here's an event display from CMS that we saw earlier. These little green pillars here, the pillar's height representing the amount of energy deposited in the calorimeter there, these are two reconstructed photons. And just like those four muons, we can take their measured energy and momentum and calculate an estimate of the mass of that two photon system. And if it comes from a Higgs, perhaps we will see a feature. So we did the same thing, looking at the invariant mass of two photons, collecting data. You can see there's a lot more events in this channel. And it's a lot more subtle signature. In fact, you can't really see anything until you get many, 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 many events. And you start to see an emergent feature. Now, this is a very subtle feature there. In fact, you can almost miss it if you didn't know what you were looking for. And this little bump, we thought and think, was evidence of a Higgs boson. Now, looking at this on its own may not be very impressive. But what we had at the time was two experiments, CMS and ATLAS, a competing experiment, each of them in two different ways, observing an excess of events localized in a little bump. And in all four cases, that little bump was in exactly the same place, or pretty damn close. And so, in 2012, over the summer, July 4th, these two experiments claimed that they had observed the Higgs boson. Now, you may ask yourself, how sure are we, or how sure were we, particularly then, that this was the Higgs? So at the time, and this is a figure that I took out of one of the seminar talks announcing the discovery of the Higgs, this tells us, as a function of the mass, how unlikely it is that a random fluctuation in our data would have produced the features that we saw. And that's what's called a p-value. So these are probabilities. And what it basically tells us is that about one in a five million experiments would see this by chance without a new particle being there. That's equivalent to, say, flipping a coin and getting heads 22 times in a row. It's a pretty low probability. In fact, now, with a, quite a bit of data later, we've reduced this, this chance of this being a random fluctuation by another few orders of magnitude. So when I say this is true, that the Higgs exists, I say that the chances of it not existing or being a random fluctuation are very small. And that's effectively the best we can say. So on July 4th, there was this announcement. And we drank champagne and other things. It was very exciting. And prizes were given. The following year, in 2013, Peter Higgs and Francois Englert of Englert and Brout, who were, were other scientists who also, over the summer in 1964, had actually predicted similar things to the Higgs mechanism, won the Nobel Prize for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that are, contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles. So with the discovery of the Higgs boson, the final piece of the standard model had been confirmed. Some graduate students who had been slaving away were able to finally graduate. Some postdocs realized that maybe they would be employed after this experiment for the first time. But then the question was, now what? Are we done? Is that everything? What does it even mean? So what I want to cover in the remaining time is a few questions. First of all, is this new particle the Higgs? Or is it just some other new particle? What does this discovery tell us about our universe? And are we done? What does this discovery tell us about future discoveries, or lack thereof, in particle physics? So first of all, since we've discovered this particle in the following years, we've been studying it and studying its properties. And one of the important prediction of the Higgs mechanism, not just producing a new particle, which is the Higgs boson, but is related to this correlation here. So what you see here is particle mass 
of different fundamental subatomic particles. And what you see on this axis is essentially the strength that it couples to the Higgs boson. And according to the Higgs mechanism, because it is giving mass to these particles, the amount of mass they have should have this very beautiful and linear correlation with how strong they interact with the Higgs boson. And so these are our measurements so far. So early on, we saw the Higgs interact with, well, through other particles with photons and through other particles with muons. You can see we've seen it now with top quarks, Z and W bosons, B quarks, tau leptons, and we have an, an upper limit on the interactions with muons. And it fits this picture very nicely. So this is our way of trying to confirm to a certain accuracy the Higgs mechanism. And so far, so good. It looks like a Higgs. The other important thing about a Higgs boson, and maybe even, well, equally important, let's say, to its ability to give mass to these particles, is its spin. And so in 2010, while we were preparing to turn on the detector again, some colleagues and I proposed a way that if we were to discover a particle, like a Higgs boson, how could we prove that it's actually a Higgs? Or maybe more specifically, how could we prove that it has the quantum numbers of the Higgs, which are very special because this pervasive Higgs field was supposed to have the quantum numbers of the vacuum, basically empty space or not so empty space as we know now. And we had never observed a particle that has these quantum numbers before. And so what we wanted to figure out was a way, if we were to discover particle, to essentially play boson guess who. How could we figure out what, by asking questions, and in fact, it's quite similar to guess who, whether or not this particle was in fact a Higgs boson, whether it had the right quantum numbers of a Higgs boson. And uh, I got a lot of kicks out of this in 2010. In fact, I realized when I first used this analogy that, that Peter Higgs is on the cover of the guess who box, quite remarkably. Now, the idea is, what are the quantum numbers of this new particle? And so quantum numbers, J is spin, C and P are symmetries, charge symmetry and parity symmetry. So what is the spin of this particle? And how does its behavior transform if you were to say flip the charge of all the particles or flip the parity, essentially look at things in a mirror? And the Higgs boson is very special. It's a scalar particle, spin zero, and it has plus plus or positive charge, it's positive charge and positive parity symmetries. And this we had never observed before. And it's very special. And what we wanted to figure out was, could we tell the difference between whether this particle had these quantum numbers or something entirely different? Is this just some new particle that's not the Higgs particle, but is doing something different in the addition to the standard model? Now, what we found was that it looks like a Higgs. And the way you do this is effectively, you have to consider the Higgs hypothesis against other hypotheses. And you run a lot of toy experiments, so basically pseudo experiments, throwing dice and pretending we had measured a bunch of different events corresponding to one of these hypotheses. And these are the distribution of these pseudo experiments in something called a log likelihood ratio. But effectively, if it was a Higgs, we expected the outcomes to be distributed like this orange curve. And if it was something else, in this case, a pseudo scalar, we expect it to be distributed like this. And what we observed in our actual data was this. So it looks like a Higgs. And in fact, out of all the different possibilities we've compared it to, it looks a lot like a Higgs to a quite high significance. So it looks like is the Higgs mass, and here these circles show what we've measured with uncertainties for the Higgs mass, and the top quark mass. And what you find is that the combination of the Higgs mass and the top quark mass, and these are the measurements shown in these little circles, tell us something about the stability of our universe. And right now, the central values for these measurements, albeit with large error bars, particularly on the top mass, tell us that we're actually not in a stable universe, but we're maybe in a meta-stable universe. What that means is, as we were talking about this Higgs potential earlier in the talk, we have the Higgs, we're sitting at one of these minima, in this vacuum, but unless the potential keeps going up like this, perhaps there's other minima, other local minima stable, or perhaps cases corresponding to a metastable state. 
because in quantum mechanics, unlike classical mechanics, things jitter around and have quantum fluctuations. And that means if you're a ball sitting here, but there's a lower energy state you can get to here, you will find your way there eventually with some probability. And if in fact our universe is sitting in this vacuum, but there exists a lower energy metastable vacuum, then after some time, perhaps, the universe could essentially collapse into this different minimum, leading to a different vacuum expectation value for the Higgs, leading to completely different behavior in the universe. Now, is the universe going to end? First of all, the Higgs wouldn't end the universe, and our discovery of it wouldn't end the universe. A recent estimate, actually in the last couple weeks, suggests that we are, if we are in a metastable state, that the lifetime of the universe will only be about 10 to 139 years. So, go out tonight and do everything you've dreamed of doing because you only have maybe 10 to the 139 years left to do it. On the other hand, maybe it's much shorter. Well, what's interesting about this picture is this is assuming that there is only the standard model and that we've discovered all the subatomic particles there are to discover. And what the Higgs also tells us is maybe this is not the case. So is this the end of the story? Well, no, it's the end of a chapter of the story. It's, it's a very important confirmation of a, a seemingly contrived, but it turns out to be true part of the fundamental physics that describe our universe. But it's not the end of the story of particle physics. And in fact, the Higgs may be pointing the direction to the next big discovery or leap in understanding. So there's still many unanswered questions in particle physics, and the important things about these unanswered questions is that we know that the standard model can't explain them. There needs to be something else. So an abridged version of these are questions, why do the quarks and leptons have the masses that they do? We know now, or we think the Higgs boson, or interaction with the Higgs field, gives these particles their masses, but why do they vary so dramatically? Why are they orders of magnitude different? Why? Are these just numbers that were prescribed arbitrarily in our universe? Or is there dynamics that describe why they have to have the values they do and their relations? What is the source of neutrino masses? And we know neutrinos have mass. They're very small. They don't get mass from the Higgs boson. Where do they get mass? We still don't know, and it's not explained in the standard model. Are all of these particles fundamental? Or are they made of something smaller? What we found is every time we look smaller, we tend to be able to find that we can break things apart that we previously thought were indivisible. Can we break apart quarks or leptons and what lives inside of them? Why are the strengths of all the fundamental forces so different? So one important thing about the Higgs boson is that the Higgs boson explains what we call electroweak symmetry breaking. And what that means is at very high scales, or very high temperatures, or very early in the universe, when this potential didn't have these two little minima and the Higgs field wasn't turned on, the weak force and the electromagnetic force were actually the same force. And what we think, aesthetically largely, is that perhaps all of the forces are actually part of the same force and are broken apart by similar mechanisms maybe to the Higgs field. But we don't understand if they're the same forces, just broken apart or bi, tri, or quadrificated into different forces, why are they so different in energy? And if you think that gravity is very strong, then I challenge you to do an experiment. Take a magnet, a small magnet even, and put some paper clips on it and see who wins, the gravity of the Earth or the magnetism of this permanent magnet. What you find is that gravity appears strong because we have very massive bodies and it propagates over large distances, but it's actually order 10 to the 32 times weaker than some of these other forces at small scales. Why? The standard model doesn't tell us. Why is there matter-antimatter asymmetry in our universe? We live in a matter-dominated universe. There's not magic pockets of antimatter galaxies floating around somewhere else. Um, we've basically ruled that out. But we think that unless the universe started with this asymmetry, which we don't necessarily believe it did, there needs to be some mechanism for generating over time this asymmetry. Now we know of such mechanisms, but there isn't enough of them in the standard model to explain what we see today. And so we're looking for a dynamic explanation for why this could be the case. And finally, what is the identity of dark matter in our universe? 
So we know, or we think we know, based on interactions gravitationally with other things, that there's something else out there. And we think it's some other particle, but it's not one of the standard model particles. We know it's there through a number of different experimental methods. We know some of its properties, but we have no idea what it is. But its existence tells us that there are likely other particles out there that we have yet to see yet. Now, what does the Higgs have to say about something like this? Well, the idea is that in the standard model, particles can only interact with certain other particles. And these little lines that are drawn here indicate which interactions are allowed. But you can get from any one of these particles to another one through taking various steps. It's like finding a path through these different particle states. So for example, when we smash the other two protons, we think that the gluons inside these protons can interact with top quarks like this. So these are all these little interactions that are allowed in the standard model. And we can draw diagrams like this. And in fact, mathematically, what happens in, in quantum mechanics is that every possible path for some reaction to occur happens at the same time. And the total probability or amplitude for something occurring is the sum of all these paths. So we can get two protons to a Higgs boson, not because protons interact with Higgs or even gluons interact with Higgs, but through intermediate particles. Higgs can decay to, say, Z bosons, which can decay to leptons. And in fact, this is what we think was primarily happening when we discover these Higgs events with four leptons. So the question is, if there's dark matter, if there's some new particle out there, this new particle we've discovered, the Higgs boson, could be the missing link to these other particles. This is what's called Higgs portal dark matter. The idea being that now that we've discovered this new state, perhaps this is the pathway to interacting with this new matter or new particles, maybe even not even dark matter, but other new particles that we've been missing. So it's very exciting in the sense that the Higgs boson not only is a striking confirmation of this beautiful theory of the standard model, but it is also potentially the pathway to the next big discovery. So the discovery of the Higgs boson is a confirmation of the standard model. This has been a, a, about a 50 year work in progress. Frankly, I didn't think it was true when we were looking for it, and I was sort of hoping it wasn't true seemed contrived to me, but it turns out that it is true, at least to a very high probability with a very low uncertainty. It has implications for not only the current state of the universe, but perhaps the end of the universe or its fate. It's a very striking and unique subatomic particle because it is effectively the vacuum. The Higgs field now is all around us, and we know now that the vacuum is not empty. It's full of Higgs field everywhere in the universe. But this is not the end of the story as the Higgs may provide a path to future discoveries. In both being a confirmation of what we thought could be happening is now perhaps a signpost to the next steps of discovery and the next chapter of this story. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and have a wonderful evening. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so I thought it was a really interesting talk. Uh, last thing you just said uh, was really interesting to me about your uh, sort of skepticism or your sort of uh, your anticipation of there not being a Higgs boson. What was your thought process behind that? What was maybe your like intentions or or thoughts as to why or what it could have been or couldn't have been? Well, so, so I think there's two parts to this answer. One of them I would call the secret part, which is I preferred that there wasn't a Higgs because I thought it was more interesting. And so by thinking about that, I was trying to realize that reality. Um, it turns out that the secret doesn't work, in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, the, the mechanism itself just seemed a little weird. I mean, one thing in particle physics that we, we pay a high, a lot of credence to is aesthetics, which may seem weird and it may seem a little unscientific, but empirically what we found is that, particularly with subatomic particles, the theories that describe them have a lot of symmetry and a lot of aesthetic beauty. 
And so the theory of fundamental particles in the standard model had all of these great things, and people realized in the 60s and 70s how we could do finite calculations of real processes with them. The problem is these theories did not accommodate particles with mass. And so one of two things was true. Our aesthetic, let's say, preferences were wrong and off base, or, <clears throat> excuse me, through sort of almost like, almost like a, let's say, a, almost like cheating through the back door, this Higgs field through this Higgs mechanism was able to give them mass. And in terms of parsimony, this theory had very little. It seemed contrived and not minimal. And Occam's razor seemed to indicate that, oh, you're wrong, this is not the right thing. And in fact, many people thought this for a long time. But the standard model continued to produce remarkable predictions that were confirmed by experiment for decades, and people's belief in the Higgs tended to grow. So I'd say part of it was selfish, because I thought it'd be more interesting if it wasn't the Higgs, because we had studied the possibility of a Higgs so much, we already had a very good idea of what it should look like and what we would do if we discovered it. I wanted there to be more uncertainty and excitement and chaos. But it turned out to be true. So in some sense, it's not as aesthetically elegant as some of these other possibilities, but it turns out to be true. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a, like a discovery of like something like, oh, that, that's interesting, instead of, oh, that's exactly what we thought. It's like, well, that's weird, you know, becomes yeah. a much more interesting discovery. Uh, real quick, though, I did want to ask, I, I don't know who it was, but there was a gentleman working for, or with CERN, I, he had said something about, uh, we would have discovered, there, there's no, there's probably not a possibility of ghosts because we would have discovered them during our experiments with, with the Large Hague Collider. Did you hear, are you familiar with any of that recently? Like Neil deGrasse Tyson and... Ghosts? Yeah, like the super, like spirits, like... Like, uh, like the spirits of humans? Or yeah, there would, there, like there's, yeah, or just, and that's what he's saying, that they, that they prove that it's not possible because we would have run into some sort of situation that like we, like we could have, uh, it's really hard to describe because of obviously the material, but like we, there would have been some indication of that sort of thing with what you guys were doing. I don't know if that's anything you're familiar with. I, can't, no. I wish I knew. I wish I knew the name of the guy. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, I thought we agreed that we weren't going to tell anyone about the ghosts we found in the tunnels of the LHC, but apparently someone blew the lid. No, I, I haven't heard anything about that. That sounds interesting, though. I don't, off the top of my head, know how what we've done indicates that there's not ghosts. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, to my knowledge, we have not proven or disproven the existence of ghosts. But now I'm going to try. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't have any idea what you're saying, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> Good. That, that's the impression I was going for. I wasn't trying to explain anything, but rather leave you with this feeling that, that something wonderful can happen. Uh, uh, so, um, with the new discovery of uh, the gravitational waves in 2017. I have no background in physics and I've just watched a few YouTube videos, so there's my credentials. But uh, how does that affect the standard model, if at all? Well, so it, it's partially related to the standard model. So the, the question's about gravitational waves and, what was it, a couple years ago? Was it 2016? I can't, 2015? The, the LIGO experiment discovered evidence for gravitational waves. And gravitational waves, like electromagnetic waves, but maybe more exciting, are essentially waves traveling through space-time caused by very massive things moving very quickly and oscillating and basically causing these waves. If all of space and time is a sheet, these gravitational waves are someone shaking this sheet. Now, in terms of particle physics, it doesn't have direct immediate implications, but it's an important confirmation of our understanding of, of general relativity or similar theories. And 
it is consistent still with the idea that maybe gravity could be described by a similar, similar subatomic mediator, a graviton, basically the force carrier of gravity, and that maybe we could unify the theory of gravity with the theory of the other subatomic particles in the near future. Now, I don't know how to do that, and people have been trying to do that for some time. But it, I thought the, the discovery of gravitational waves was, was incredibly exciting. And in some ways, it's like hearing the universe speak to you in a new way that you've never been able to hear before. It's like being blind and then suddenly seeing, seeing light. So it doesn't have a direct connection necessarily to the Higgs boson, but it's, it's a startling confirmation and a quite an impressive experimental measurement of, of something that is consistent with this picture of all the forces being related to these fields, which have potentially these quanta, these subatomic particles that are excitations of these fields that we could realize. And so gravitational waves are, are pretty cool. And uh, maybe because I was so jaded, I was almost more excited about that discovery than our discovery. But that's what happens when you work on something for too long, maybe. Maybe that explains why I, th I thought I wanted it not to be a Higgs boson. Yes? Are there any other uh, predictions you're hoping don't pan out? Don't pan out. Well, I work pretty well for the Higgs boson. Yeah, so maybe I should just predict things not happening that I want to happen. Um, so, well, one thing to note is that people in our field, some people, have been very discouraged as of late because we haven't seen anything remarkably new beyond the Higgs yet since we've been running these experiments. And there were a lot of aesthetic reasons to believe that maybe we should. And so we've started to, to second guess some of our, let's say, intuitions about how and what we're looking for. So the idea is, well, to put it, to put it very simply, the Higgs boson and the Higgs field has some mass and some vacuum expectation value, and it's just some value. And we don't know why it's the value that it is. Why isn't it zero? Why isn't it the biggest value it could be, the Planck scale? What stabilizes the Higgs in this regime that can realize the world we see around us? And what we believe is that there needs to be some other mechanism that does this, and that mechanism needs to be related to the Higgs, and it means it's likely acting at a similar energy to that necessary to produce a Higgs. And we expected to maybe see some evidence of this already, and many people think now that we were wrong and that maybe the standard model is all there is. And so in terms of a, a prediction that we won't see something new in the next few years at the LHC, I would say that I believe that's wrong. I think we are going to see evidence of something remarkably new in the next few years, but that is also largely my selfish hope which so far empirically has not worked out very well. So maybe I should say I don't want that to happen. Yes? When you talk about particles going 0.999 speed of light, are there relativistic effects yet taken into account? There's time dilation or they're shortening or, you know, these yes. photons are going that fast? Yeah, so these particles, so, so the question's referring to the fact that because of Einstein's theory of special relativity, effectively we don't think that in at least the vacuum or empty space, things can travel faster than the speed of light. And what happens is the rules of special relativity indicate that as things start traveling very close to the speed of light, things start happening to make it so they never reach it. And space starts stretching or contracting and time dilates. It can go faster or slower depending on how fast you're moving. Relativistic effects that can actually be perceived at these very high speeds. So what we can say is, yeah, these protons, if, if I was a very small person riding on the back of one of these protons, I would experience space and time very differently than we do sitting in the control room watching these beams go around. But in fact, the, these beams are, they're more like, they're more like tabletop light experiments in that it's, it's like optics. You're focusing these beams using magnets, kind of like almost magnifying glasses of a type, except using magnetic fields. And they're kind of oscillating around this ring and colliding at given points. And these beams go around for about 10 to 12 hours when things are running correctly, maintaining this thing. So if anything, it's kind of like 
almost maintaining like a current in a circuit at any given time, rather than necessarily resolving individual protons and thinking about the effects on them. So you just have this, this flux of positive charge with these protons, sort of in these different orbital states almost of this very complicated optical experiment. I mean, by many estimates, the LHC, which I don't work on directly to make this thing collide protons, I just work on the detector that sees what comes out, is arguably the world's most complex machine ever, and maybe for the foreseeable future. It's quite a, a remarkable achievement to take hundreds of billions of protons, get them into a small enough volume where you have you know, tens of microns, and that's smaller than the gap that I'm showing you between my fingers. A micron is 10 to the negative six meters, it's very small. And getting this thing around a 27 kilometer ring and getting to hit another little tens of micron bunch of protons, that's pretty remarkable, I think. And if you weren't able to do it so precisely, we wouldn't be able to see anything come out of these collisions, or they would be much more rare. So it's quite, it's quite a remarkable feat. If the Texas Collider had come into being since it was considerably larger than the Large Hadron Collider, what would have been the advantages of that? Well, we would have discovered the Higgs much sooner. Because the energy is higher, it means we could have pushed further beyond the Higgs than we're going to be able to do with the machine we have. And so in fact, there's a proposal, so to put things in context, the design energy of the LHC is 14 TeV, tera electron volts. The SSC in Texas would have been 40. And we're discussing an upgrade over maybe the next 20 years at CERN to get the LHC to maybe like 33. Not even still at the SSC level. So in terms of time, we would have discovered the Higgs earlier, but it also means that we would have been able to push our horizons further even by decades, or maybe even in the worst case scenario, by more than that, because we would have had this device that can already do it. We're trying to get money and commitments to build the next thing, which maybe wouldn't even exceed what we would have had in the 90s if the SSC had been built. And selfishly, it means that I wouldn't have to fly to Geneva, Switzerland a lot, and I could be sitting in Texas doing physics there in the United States, which would be great. But, uh, yeah, it, it was very unfortunate. And I think more practically, from a, from a US perspective, it was a very unfortunate turn of events for the future of particle physics and this type of physics in general in this country. Because a lot of people had invested a lot of time and energy and resources preparing for this thing that was canceled, maybe a little bit capriciously. So yeah, that's unfortunate. In an attempt to uh, try to understand a lot of this abstract information, um, the way I understand it, the Higgs boson is what gives mass to, to everything. Well, that, that's a very good question. And the answer is not quite. So the Higgs boson, as we understand it, gives mass to these subatomic particles, which is very important in its own right. But if you ask yourself why you and I have mass, in fact, probably about 99%, maybe even more of that mass, is not from the Higgs field. It's from the interactions of the strong force inside nuclei and the energy, binding energy stored there in these particles. So it's a, it's a remarkable thing that the Higgs boson gives mass to these subatomic particles, but it's not necessarily why we have mass at a macroscopic scale, because most of our mass is not because these individual little particles have mass, but because the binding energies of this, these nuclei that make up the atoms and molecules in our body have this enormous energy density which manifests itself as our mass. So, yeah. Okay. There's Thank other you. things at play too. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs>
Going once. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Almost. So uh, you explained that maybe the Higgs boson is like the particle implicated in the inflation period of the potentially. universe. Sorry? Potentially. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Exactly. How should you design an experiment, an experiment to actually test that idea? Whether it's the Higgs boson? I don't, I don't know if a single experiment could, could actually test that. I think um, I think more likely to understand something like that would be cosmology experiments rather than a particle physics collider experiment. But we can study particles interacting and their interactions with matter. But for some things about the universe, you would need to understand the properties a little bit better of the early universe. And essentially to do that, we need to look further out into the cosmos. Because as, as Fred was explaining, you know, the, the universe started, we think, as a very small point. And because it expanded so exponentially and so quickly, quantum fluctuations on very small scales imprinted themselves on very big scales. And that's why we have structure in the universe. But what it also means is that when we look out in the universe, essentially we're looking back in time. And so to some degree, we need to look further and back in time and more expansively and more accurately in our universe to understand its properties. And in terms of the, the nature of the Big Bang or inflation, I think that is how we're going to understand it. So the answer would be build more telescopes and more satellite-based telescopes, essentially, but also give us money to keep doing particle physics, because we may come up with the answer, but I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> all the time we had for questions.